Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The Porter wire is an appliance used to produce bilateral expansion of the maxillary posterior teeth. This appliance is used most often to correct posterior functional crossbites. The left side posterior teeth on these models shows a posterior crossbite relationship. The dental midlines in this case in centric occlusion do not coincide. The maxillary midline is displaced off to the patient's right mandibular midline, deviated to the left. The right side occlusion of the patient posteriorly demonstrates the normal buccal-lingual relationship of teeth. In centric relation position, the right side primary cuspid tooth right here is the first tooth to contact and it provides an occlusal interference. This occlusal interference causes the mandible to shift to the left into the posterior crossbite to avoid the uncomfortableness of that occlusal interference. Now it is the occlusal interference that triggers the mandibular functional shift to the left but actually it is a bilateral narrowness of the maxillary dental arch that is responsible for the posterior crossbite. There is in actual fact a symmetric narrowness of the maxillary dental arch, as you can see here, in relationship to the width of the mandibular posterior teeth. Now, the Porter wire appliance can be used to correct this bilateral symmetric posterior tooth narrowness of the upper dental arch through expansion of those maxillary posterior teeth. Now in this presentation we will demonstrate a laboratory technique for the fabrication of the Porter wire appliance. Also we plan to demonstrate the method of activating the Porter wire appliance for use in the mouth. Before you attempt to construct a porter wire, it's necessary that you be very familiar with the basic orthodontic soldering techniques. These techniques are demonstrated in the videotape entitled basic, basic Orthodontic Soldering Techniques. And the soldering techniques that are used and needed specifically for porter wire construction are demonstrated on that videotape. I suggest that you review this videotape before attempting to construct a porter wire appliance. The first step in the actual clinical construction of a porter wire appliance is to fit some bands on the maxillary first permanent molar teeth. The bands are removed after they have been adapted to the molars and half round Mershon tubes are soldered onto the lingual surface of those molar bands. Now this tube should be positioned so that its occlusal surface is 0 0.038 inches gingival to the occlusal edge of the molar band. The tube should be centered mesiodistally on the lingual surface of the molar band. The solder joint must be smooth and continuous and it must be free of any pits or surface defects. And lastly, there should be no solder flow down into the tube to prevent a complete seating of the Mershon shaft. 
the bands after the half round tubes are soldered on are placed back onto the first permanent molars in the mouth and an alginate impression is taken of the maxillary dental arch. Now in this maxillary impression, some small squares of alginate are removed from the buccal and lingual of the molar band impression. The alginate is removed right down to the tray metal. What we are going to do is sticky wax the bands into position in the impression by attaching the band directly then to the tray metal with sticky wax. This will secure it in place while the model is being poured up. You seat the band down into the impression. It will rest passively in a certain position on the alginate. There is some give to the alginate, but the small indentation made by the edge of the molar band is enough to adequately support that molar band while you sticky wax it in place in a, in a secure and accurate position. Now, rapid stone, white rapid stone, is used to pour the work model impressions. Again, I emphasize it's a very important that the bands be well secured in the impression before the model is poured up to ensure as much accuracy as is possible. Now, the work model then has been prepared. In the preparation of this model, it's important that the base of the work model be trimmed so that it is fairly closely parallel to the occlusal surface of the, the molar teeth. This will help you to visualize the symmetry of the completed porter wire appliance more easily during the construction. There is uh, no specific uh, form for trimming the, the rest of the work model base. A pencil outline is drawn on the work model. This outline extends mesially from the first permanent molar right along the <coughs> lingual surface of the posterior teeth just above the free gingival margin. The wire turns palatally just at the distal of the first permanent molar band, and it extends mesially at the level of the highest palatal rugae, the most superior palatal rugae. And the inner portion of the wire is parallel to the lateral arm portion of the wire. The pencil outline also shows symmetry from side to side when viewed from the back. The same distance between the inner portion of the wire and the lateral arm is present on both sides of the model. To start the construction of the wire portion, you take a length of 0.038 inch diameter gold wire. Six to eight inches of length is sufficient. You hold the wire on the work model and measure off the distance that you need to construct the first lateral arm. The wire is marked. You can see the white mark on the wire directly above the half round tube. This white mark indicates the spot where the half round shaft is to be soldered. OK, the shaft has been soldered on. Exactly on the mark that you made on your wire, 
the solder joint should be smooth and continuous between the shaft and the main wire. There should be no solder flowed down onto the sides of the Mershon shaft. And it's important that the shaft be centered on the wire, as shown here. The very end of the shaft can be rounded somewhat to remove any burrs that would prevent the, the easy seating of the shaft into the half round tube on the molar band. To begin the actual bending of the wire, the shaft is tried into the tube on the first permanent molar on the work model. Now this shaft slides very tightly into this tube the first few times. It is supposed to be a precision fit. It's supposed to be a tight fit. We don't want you to grind on the sides of that shaft to make it fit better into the tube. This will make it very sloppy and almost useless for tooth movement. The first step is to bend the lateral arm of the porter wire to adapt to the pencil outline along the free gingival margin on the teeth. You can start by holding your finger over the molar band and just moving the wire with a little finger pressure in the right direction. The wire is removed from the work model. Each time you remove it, put your finger over the top of the molar band to prevent any breakage possibility. An offset bend is made to move the wire from this point here at the top of the tube down to its first contact on the lingual surface of that second primary molar. To make this offset bend, the wire is placed in the pliers with the beaks just mesial to the shaft and with thumb pressure or finger pressure, a bending force is applied. The second bend in the offset can be estimated by holding the wire back over the top of the tube and marking a spot on the wire about halfway between the point where the first bend is and where the first contact point is going to be. The second half of the offset bend is made, placing the wire again in the pliers and with pressure from the finger or the thumb, force is applied to make the bend. You try the, the wire back down in the tube on the work model. And from a superior view, the wire has been uh, moved to its proper position. From, from a side view, the wire has to be offset gingivally in order to make it contact properly. So again, the wire is removed from the work model and a downward offset bend is made. Again, first placing the pliers just mesial to the shaft and another compensating bend made right at the second bend that you made in the original offset, the horizontal. You can make one offset bend to take care of both the horizontal and the vertical adjustment to make this, this arm contact the teeth. If, if you are lucky enough to make it fit the first time. Now the wire has been adapted to contact then the second primary molar, just above the free gingival margin. You can make a mark then at the point on the second primary molar where the contact is made and another bend can be made to bring the wire into contact with all the rest of the teeth in that quadrant. 
Now, very often the lateral arm of a porter wire is left straight. It's not bent to adapt to the lingual surfaces of the teeth as I'm doing on this model. It depends on the case. It depends on what you want to accomplish with the, with the uh, porter wire appliance. Some bend has been made. I'm going to make another little adjustment bend to bring it in just a little farther. Now, the, the lateral arm has been fairly well adapted. It could go gingerly just a bit in this anterior portion. Another bend could be made back in this area to accomplish that. To bend the palatal portion of the porter wire, you see the pencil outline starts down into the palatal vault right at the distal of the first permanent molar. So that is where the plier beaks have to be placed. Try to get some idea of the angulation of the loop that you're going to bend to the shaft by taking a look at it from the, from the back of the work model. At least you'll get some estimate that of the angle between the, the shaft and the loop that you're going to bend in the wire, the curvature. The beaks of the plier are placed just distal to the shaft and when you have it angulated properly, you begin to sweep the wire down in a smooth and continuous curve. to bend this distal extension of the porter wire. We want no sharp bends in the wire. It should be a smooth curve like that. You can try it back on the model. The loop has been bent a bit too large, so an adjustment can be made to make it smaller. Also, it appears that the loop is, is a bit too parallel to the shaft, and so there's going to be a lot of contact of the wire on the plaster of the, of the pallet. There has to be a greater angle between the, the loop and the shaft. The bending of this wire requires a lot of uh, uh, trying it on the model and removing it and making more adjustment bends until you can form it into, into the configuration that you want for active tooth movement in the mouth. Now I'm going to move this loop portion up off the palatal tissues. In other words, increase the angle between the, the shaft and the wire portion. You grasp the wire right over the top of the Mershon shaft in order to make such an adjustment bend. And with your finger, apply some force to the wire to make a bend. Because of the interference of the anterior teeth, it's not possible to, to fit the, the shaft down into the tube again. So you have to estimate the place where the uh, anterior curvature of the palatal portion of the wire should begin. And I made a mark here where I would estimate that curve should begin. You place the pliers on your mark and again make a smooth, continuous curvature in the wire. At this point, you can try the wire back on the model by actually placing the shaft down in the tube, as I'm doing right here. Now, it's obvious that <coughs> A sharper bend has to be made in this area here. More curvature has to be placed in the wire in order to bring it into 
cur the, the outline that I've drawn with the pencil. Also, in increasing the curvature here will move this portion of the wire forward and thus make it adapt more closely to the pencil outline. The wire is bent to be adapted about one to two millimeters off the palatal tissue in the anterior extension of the palatal loop portion, and it's two to three millimeters off the tissue in this distal area of the palatal loop portion. I'm going to demonstrate one more type of bend. The wire is contacting the model in this area here, and it should be two to three millimeters off the tissue, actually, in that part to be properly constructed for use in the mouth. So a bend has to be made to bring that portion of the wire up off the palatal tissue. First, I'm going to increase that curvature in that area that's needed in order to make it fit the pencil outline. That's done by just placing the wire in the pliers again and placing a little force on the, with your fingers to, to bend this portion of the wire up off the palatal tissue. Again, the shaft is placed between the beaks of the plier. You can even place it down more towards the flat base portion of the plier. And with your thumb, you can apply some force to bend the wire up off the tissue in that area just distal to the shaft. Uh, some adjustment has to be made in the palatal portion to allow it to fit back onto the model. Let's try it back on the work model and see if a bend has, in fact, been made. Now, sliding the wire back down in the shaft, You can see that the wire has been bent upward then off the palatal tissues at just about the amount that you want, two to three millimeters, to prevent any impingement when this appliance is placed in the mouth. Now, a long series of adjustments is needed to adapt this wire to the pencil outline of the type I've just demonstrated. And the wire should end up, as I said, one to two millimeters off the palatal tissue all the way around the palatal vault area on the pencil outline. Now, this can be a lengthy procedure, can take 15 to 20 minutes of wire bending using the same principles. The wire has been adapted to the pencil outline in the work model. The wire lies right above the half round tube on the opposite side molar band now. A pencil mark is made directly over the top of the tube, marking the spot where the second half round shaft is to be soldered. Now at this point, before you remove the wire from the model, you should look at the angle that the tube makes to this posterior loop in the wire. In soldering on that second half round shaft, try to roughly approximate this angle in attaching the shaft to the wire in the solder joint. It is just at slightly angle, almost parallel to that loop on this particular model. The wire is removed from the work model and the half round shaft is soldered on. Now, the half round shaft is held in soldering forceps like this. If you have only two shafts to hold on to, hang on with the forceps right as far down on the shafts as you possibly can to prevent uh, heat transfer from the solder joint area into the forceps. We want the heat to be concentrated in the area 
of the wire and the shafts being attached. The shaft is held at the proper angle or your estimate of the proper angle and right over the pencil mark and it's moved into the soldering flame and the solder joint is made. I want to show you at this point too an example of the type of uh, burrs that can occur at the end of the half round shafts. Very slight metal burrs that can be ground off, that can be removed before the solder joint is made and after the solder joint is made on the gingival end of that shaft. The solder joint has been made attaching the second shaft to the wire. At this point, you should pacify the wire. The, to do this, you place the half round shaft back into the tube. And you can see that the opposite side half round shaft, the one you just soldered on, doesn't fit too well. It lies, in this case, distal to the, the tube. And by pulling it with your finger, you can see that by placing the shaft down into the tube, some force would be applied to this molar if it were placed in the mouth. It's not passive at this point. To pacify the wire, you place the shaft down into the half round tube on the opposite side. Sometimes some wire bending adjustments are needed before you can place the shaft down in the tube on the other side in order to even get it to fit in. Pacification is done with a flame that has a shape a bit different than that used for orthodontic soldering. It is called a brush flame. It is taller and there is more hissing noise in, produced by the, the blowpipe with this type of brush flame. It is about an inch and a half tall altogether going to turn the lights down and try to show you the change of color that takes place during the heat treating process. As the flame is applied to the wire and you move along the wire, a glow, a very slight shininess in the wire. You can see it just at the front loop portion right now. And it begins to fade as you move by. Again, I'll come by the front loop portion. You can see that slight shininess that is present in the wire during the moment of heat treating, right there. This is the effect that you want to see over the entire length of the wire, just like that. But you don't want to overheat it in any one area, so you keep the flame moving at all times. To start the heat treating process, you hold the blowpipe over the model. You're going to heat the wire until it just begins to turn color ever so slightly. You keep the flame moving the whole time during this procedure. Every portion of the palatal loop in the wire is heated. Also during this procedure, you can change the adaptation of the wire by touching it with an instrument. At this point right here, the palatal loop portion of the wire is too close to the tissue. It is off the tissue more than I would like to see it on this side. In order to make this adjustment, you can place an instrument between the wire and the model and hold it there while you do the, the heat treating process again, moving the flame, 
not rapidly, but not holding it in one spot too long, over the, the metal. You can approach your solder joints very closely. You can actually go over the top of solder joints with the heat treating flame. The heat treating process requires a, a temperature four to 500 degrees less than, than that required to melt orthodontic cold solder. Now, after you've heat treated it with the instrument in place, if you let the wire cool, the wire will retain the configuration that you imposed upon it with the instrument that was held in that place. It's now off the tissue in this area and off the tissue in this area a similar amount. Now, we can't be sure that it's pacified yet, but we're going to try it the test for pacification. And what we do then is remove the shaft on one side of the wire. And if the wire is passive, the shaft will rest just on the outside surface of that half round tube. This wire has been pacified fairly well. I think it could use a bit more pacification. When the wire is passive, it will slide very easily back down into the half round tube. Very little force is required to push it down in. It slides right to place. In other words, when the shafts are down in the tube, there is no orthodontic force being applied to the molar teeth. When the wire is in a passive state, you remove the, the shaft from the tube on the opposite side, and this side is perfectly pacified. The shaft rests very easily on the outside of that half round tube directly outside of it, directly parallel to it. You can not only see the pacified state, but you can feel it by placing the shaft back down in the tube, and it goes in with very light force, very light pressure is required to move the uh, shaft back down into the tube. After this palatal portion of the wire is pacified, you adapt the, the second lateral arm in the same manner that the first lateral arm was adapted. An offset bend is made just at the mesial of the half round tube, the, the shaft, and the second offset bend is made farther down the wire, about halfway between the, the, the first bend and the desired contact point on the second primary molar. One bend would, would bring that into contact with the second primary molar in that side of the mouth. When that bend has been made and the wire has been adapted the way you want it, you mark the wire and cut it off just mesial to the cuspid tooth in the quadrant. After this, the second lateral arm has been bent and adapted to contact the lingual surfaces of the teeth, the, the wire is again heat treated, and it's heat treated so that the lateral arms are also contacted by the flame, so that the offset bends that you placed in the wire show a, a, a passive state also. Now, at this point, after the wire has been completely formed and it's passive, the Loctite wires are soldered on to the main wire of the Porter wire. To solder on these Loctite wires, some solder is applied to the end, the tip of a piece of 
lock tight orthodontic wire. This is a dead soft wire. It bends very, very easily. There's no elasticity at all in the wire. Flux is placed on the main wire at the point that you'd like to attach the half or the uh, Loctite wire. The attachment point is about four millimeters mesial to the spot where the shaft is attached. You attach the Loctite wire very nearly parallel to the shaft, like so, in this direction here. After the Loctite wires have been applied, as shown here, the attachment of the Loctite wire is right here, and it has been bent underneath the half round tube and it locks the shaft into place in the tube. This solder joint is about four millimeters away from the solder joint attaching the shaft to the main wire. The polishing process for the porter wire is, is a very careful one. In polishing this wire you want to be sure not to distort it, not to change the passive state of the wire. You can pickle the wire first, just as you would a gold crown, and then some wet pumice can be placed between the fingers, and you can cl clean the wire with the wet pumice between the fingers. Again, trying very carefully not to uh, bend the wire in any way and change its form. Some Rubber wheels, Kratex wheels, can be used to further polish the wire, and steel brushes, steel brush wheels also can be used to polish the wire. BBC uh, polishing compound and rouge also can be used to, if, a, if a high shine is desired on the appliance. Usually a rubber wheel finish is sufficient for placement of the appliance in the mouth. After the wire has been polished, you try it back on the work model to be sure that it is still passive. If you're satisfied with the passiveness of the wire, the stone that's holding the bands onto the work model is cut out with laboratory knives and hand instruments, and the bands are polished also. The, the whole appliance is uh, sterilized in a Zephyrin chloride solution, cold sterilization, before it is cemented into the mouth. The final product, Porter Wire, has certain characteristics. It should be uh, very symmetric, with the inner portion of the wire parallel with the lateral arm portion of the wire. From a view in back, the wire is also symmetric from side to side. The palatal portion of the wire should be one to two millimeters off the tissues. In this extension here, the wire should be two to three millimeters off the tissue in the area just at the distal aspect of the first permanent molar. The lateral arms of the appliance contact the posterior teeth just above the free gingival margin. The wire curves palatally at the distal 
of the first permanent molar, not beyond it, not before it. For cementation into the mouth, the appliance is, first of all, the appliance is cemented passively. It is cemented as one unit. It has one unit means that the bands are attached to the wire with the Loctite wire in place before it is cemented into the mouth. Now these Loctite wires may be bent into one of two configurations. They may be bent directly underneath the gingival aspect of the tube as shown here and cut off just at the distal aspect of the tube. That's one way that the Loctite wire can be used to hold the shaft down in place. In cases where the gingiva is very high on a patient, the gingival tissues are contacting the gingival surface of that half round tube a small loop can be bent, a bend can be made in the Loctite wire so that only the tip of the Loctite wire goes underneath the half round tube. Only the tip of the wire goes between the free gingival margin and the end, the gingival end of that half round tube. For cementation in the mouth, the bands are completely filled with cement, and it is placed in the mouth as one unit, pushed upward with both bands being pushed to place, seated to place at the same time. This is to ensure the maximum amount of, of a passiveness in the original appliance as it's placed in the mouth. The, the activation of a porter wire appliance is intended to produce a symmetric bilateral expansion of the maxillary posterior teeth. The, uh, the appliance is activated, of course, without the bands on because the bands are already cemented in the mouth before any activation bend is made in a porter wire appliance. To activate a porter wire, you, you make bends in, in three areas. To, to make these bends, you first have to record the original width of the wire with a pencil outline of the two lateral arms. Like so. To make the activation bends, a bend is made right here at the inner palatal loop, and a compensating bend is made in the two lateral arms. Now, to make the palatal loop bend, the fingers are placed on the wire, and it is opened. Finger pressure is used to make this activation bend. Trying the wire back down onto the pattern, you can see that the molar portion of the wire has been expanded but there has been no expansion and even some contraction of the cuspid area of the lateral arms. What we want is a bilateral parallel expansion produced by this wire, so a compensating bend has to be made in the lateral arms. This is done by holding the palatal portion of the wire with your finger on one hand and bending this side outward. and then bending the other side outward in the same manner. It's important to try to 
maintain the same plane in space in this dimension here when you're making these activating bends, not to bend one lateral arm upward, one lateral arm downward. You try the wire back on your pencil outline and there has been some improvement. A bit more adjustment has to be made to bring these, the cuspid area of the lateral arms out farther. So again, the, the wire is, is held in the palatal portion with the fingers and an outward compensating bend is made. Trying it back on the model, a parallel, now it's fairly parallel, expansion has been produced, the activation. We want about two millimeters per side of parallel expansion as the initial activation for a porter wire appliance placed in the mouth. After the wire is activated, it is placed back into the half round tubes and the effect then is one of expansion of the maxillary posterior teeth. Now this appliance is, is a very effective clinically for the correction of functional posterior cross bites, but only if it's properly constructed. I hope we've been able to give you the information you need to fabricate the porter wire successfully. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.